that was quite very good worship. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Thank you all for your talents and your gifts this morning. So I'm going to be reading in Acts chapter 27. And I will be reading a little bit. So Acts chapter 27. Most of the time my talks come from my devotions. And my devotions give me a unique perspective on certain things. And so when I got switched up to this Sunday, this was part of my devotion this week. Paul set sail for Rome. So as we look at the crucified Christ and then the risen Savior, and then Paul comes along. And Paul would have lived and went throughout the different churches doing communion. That would be part of what he did. And he lived a life so much talking about the risen Savior, believing in the risen Savior, not afraid to preach and act and teach that they wanted to do away with Paul. So he was going to go to Rome and go to trial. And then, um, then a storm comes as they're on the ship. And if you go to 27, verse 21, I'm going to read there. Then I'm going to skip a little bit and read some more. After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them. And he said, men, you should have taken my advice and not sell from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves from this damage and loss. But now I urge you, keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only this ship will be destroyed. Last night an angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, stood beside me, and he said these words. Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen, just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. So, it, and I'm going to read a little bit more. But as we go through our life and we do communion, we've had a rough week maybe in between communions. Or we're in the midst of a storm or a trial. But at the end of this life, we're going to get there. And we're not going to be lost. Because Jesus said, all those that the Father gave shall be saved. All those that believed in Christ, we're going to make it to heaven. It's going to be through some rough storms. But if you stay where Christ said you go, no matter how the storm looks, don't lose faith in those hard times. So if you go down to verse 33, still chapter 27, and I'm going to read out the rest of this. So just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he says, you have been in constant suspense, you've gone without food, and you haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food You'll need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread and he gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and he began to eat. Sounds like communion, doesn't it? Sounds like a lesson that Paul's trying to teach. 
that every time we break bread, we take communion. Don't lose faith. Keep the faith. No matter where you're at, the midst of the storm you're in, keep that. I thought, wow, that's amazing. Almost like communion right there as they're going through the storm and the ship is being tossed about. Oh, I lost my place. They were all encouraged and ate some food. All together, I love this from the Bible numbers it. King James numbers it out a different way. I'm reading NIV. It says, all together, there was 276 on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lined the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decide to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar, ran aground. The bow struck fast, would not move. The storm was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks and on pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reach land safely so no life was lost just like Paul said even though the ship ran aground even though things were desperate and things were hard in the midst of all this it's like Paul still gave communion and broke bread so my talk today is that some of you are in the midst of a storm that we don't even know what you're going through. We have no idea. And you don't even know that there's a storm brewing in your life next week or next month. The light you have never seen. But Paul's word is if we stay true to God, if we stay in hope, if we take our communion as Paul did he said eat this is my body and he broke it the man I had no wine so they could drink do the rest but he definitely gave thanks and that's what we should do this represents that God's going to get us home God is faithful his broken body and his blood and our acceptance of that in our daily life and how we lead our life. And as Jim said today, how others see God in us as we go through these storms. We should be just like Paul and tell others around, be courageous, have hope, have faith. God is going to see us through to the very end. Father, thank you. As we receive your broken body by the bread, thank you, Jesus. As we receive your blood through this juice, that through the blood that we would be saved from our sins. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, that you gave this. So we never forget. We always have faith. No matter what arises in our life, that you are there, you will be there, until we get there in heavenly places. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may receive.
you all stand for the reading of God's Word? I'm reading from Acts 5, 33 through 42. When they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill him. Then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in respect by all the people and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take heed to yourself what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Theudas rose up claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. And they agreed with him, and when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. The Lord be with you. So we're continuing our series through the book of Acts, and if you um, were following along, we are going to be in um, Acts 5, and it's really I'm going to be addressing verse 12 all the way to the end of the chapter to verse 42, uh, but what we read just now was um, basically Gamaliel's advice. This is a, um, a well-renowned teacher of this time, a Pharisee who was a part of the Sanhedrin council. And what he's addressing, what he's talking about here in uh, verse 33 um, to the end uh, um, of verse uh, 42, what he's talking about is basically how they are to handle and deal with the apostles or with the church. Because in the beginning, in verse 12, what we see is that the church is just continuing to rapidly grow. And that the, the, the apostles, they have been given the abilities of what Christ did in his ministry. And so what they start to do is they start to accomplish these great signs and these great wonders. And it's gotten so extravagant to the point where crowds are starting to form all around. And it says that even outside of the city of Jerusalem now, there are these different groups that are coming outside of Jerusalem to go and see the apostles. And it says so much so that even there's this um, rumor that's been uh, moving around that says if even, even Peter walks by and his shadow shadow is there, if you can just get touched by his shadow, you're going to be healed. That's how literal, that's how fast and how um, much is going on with this supernatural activity that's happening with the spirit leading these apostles. Signs and wonders are happening and people are just, they know that if they can get to be with the apostles, there's going to be miracles that are going to happen. So all of this is going on, but as they continue to grow in number and grow in um, popularity, they also start to see how they start to increase in opposition. There is opposition that um, starts to grow more and more so. And if you remember a while back, we had already saw that people Peter and John had been arrested, right, because they had healed the lame man, and, and the religious leaders, they didn't like that. Well, now there's masses that are starting to be healed, and so what the Sanhedrin does is they arrest them again, but this time it's all 12. So they get all 12 this time, and they, they arrest them. They put them in prison for the night, and while they're in prison, an angel of God comes, and the angel, what he does is he just, he throws open the door, and he, he lets them all out, and he says, go and preach. And so what do they, they do? They get up in the middle of the night, they go to the temple, and as it's early morning, they're preaching and proclaiming Christ once again. And now the Sanhedrin doesn't know this, and so they get up the next morning, 
and they're going to say, well, what are we going to do? What are we, let's, they're going to talk about how they're going to get rid of or what they're going to, how they're going to handle the, the apostles. And as they go to send for these apostles to be taken out of prison so they could lecture and talk to them again, they say, they're not in here. They're not in the prison. So as they're figuring this out, they all of a sudden realize they're back in the temple once again. Not only are they just doing miracles, but now they're proclaiming Christ. They're proclaiming Jesus, which that's exactly what they said in chapter 4. Do not say his name anymore, right? So they're proclaiming Jesus, and so what they do is they go and arrest them again, right? So now they're arrested for the third time, and they're brought back, and then they start to, you know, question them and say, did we not tell you specifically not to preach this name? And then boldly what they say once again is, who are we to obey, God or man? Right? And we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, right? We are to obey God over our governing authorities. God is always our supreme authority. And that's what he says. But then he goes on even further. Not only does he say, we're going to obey God over you, but then he even says, and you are the ones who murdered the Lord. He says, the blood of Christ is on your hands. So he accuses them now of committing blasphemy, right? He accuses them of killing God, the Son, right? So they say this boldly, and now when they hear this, and this is what we started reading in verse 33, they heard this, and they were furious. And they basically said, we're just going to kill these guys. We're getting rid of them. Because remember, these are the same groups that got Jesus killed, right? So they, they, they decide, we're going to just kill them. But Gamaliel, as I said, this Pharisee who's on, on this council, he says, well, hold on, let's, let's think about this for a second. And so what he does is he says, you know, there have been some other insurrectionists that have rose to power and prominence and had got a, a mass following for a period of time. But these all, all these insurrectionists, they all have fallen. They, they've been conquered. They've been killed. And he says, so really what we should do here is just recognize that these insurrectionists, these movements of man, they, they fail. And so if it's not of God, it's going to fall apart. It's not going to last for very long, right? Jesus has already been killed. So if it's of man, it's going to fail. But if it's of God and we oppose them, we could be unintentionally fighting against God. And so the council, as they're thinking about this, and they already are aware of what's going on, they know about the miracles, they know that they were just in prison and now they were freed somehow, so they're knowing that this is going on, and so they're afraid that they might be potentially opposing God or fighting against God, and so they agree, and then what do they do, it says? For good measure, they beat the apostles, and then they send them on their way. Not just, you know what, you're right, we could be opposing God. Well, let's beat them anyway, and then they send them on their way. And then what do they do? It says the apostles, they rejoice. They rejoice that they were able to be put to shame for Christ's name. And so we continue to see that the church being vigilant, being courageous, being bold, and we see that as they continue to grow, we see this opposition. And so as we think about this account, the first thing that I really just want to draw out is is how we see that growth attracts opposition. See, as I said in verse 12 and really in verse 15 and 16, we see this example of God giving the apostles the, the power to perform great miracles, right? They were able to do these amazing things. It says that they were casting out demons. They were healing people. And it says that when they were healing, it says that all of them were healed. That goes back to when Jesus was doing his ministry. It says that there were masses, multitudes that would come to him, and all day he would be doing ministry, and it says, and all of them were healed. See, this is reminding us that they are his witnesses. They are being Christ-like, right? Because they are performing these signs, and they are performing these wonders. And because of this, right, as I said, you're starting to see rapid growth. And that's a, a common, ongoing theme through the book of Acts, how the church sees rapid growth as a phenomenon for the movement of the Spirit. And I think what we see as we think about them is that they, they are growing in number, as it see, shows, once again, it says that it's adding men and women in the text, which is interesting because Luke, he always wants to include women. He's really good in his gospel account to remind people that it's not just a, a masculine movement here. Rather, the kingdom of God is calling men and women 
to come and to worship and to serve and to, to perform great acts for the kingdom. But it, it mentions that there's men and women, but it also says that the surrounding cities. Now, this is the first time that it mentions outside of Jerusalem where people are starting to come and being impacted by the gospel and by the name of Christ. So this is them fulfilling the Great Commission, right? Because it says start in Jerusalem, but then you need to start to, to broaden and move out, right? And so this is them starting to make an impact outside of the city of Jerusalem. So we see them growing in number, but we also, I think, see them growing in holiness. See, that's the important thing for a church, right? Not that we just grow in number, because if we grow in number, but we're not growing in holiness, it's not a very good thing. But we see them growing in holiness, and as I said, I think that we, this alludes to this because it shows once again how they're unified, right? We see how they're powerful, they have an impact, but as I said, they are healing all people. You see the Spirit is present with them. You see them being more and more and more like Jesus. That's what holiness is. If you were a holy person, you were someone who was like Jesus. So that's what we see the growth here. We see rapid growth in numbers, and we see rapid growth in holiness. But in verse 17 and 18, we see the greater the growth, the greater the hostility. Because in this text, we see that the religious leaders, and it even explains why they were hostile. It says they were motivated by jealousy. See, they were jealous because just like Jesus, right, they, they, were the, they were the religious leaders. They were the people that people came to. They respected. They were the ones that people would glorify and put on a pedestal. But then Jesus comes along and says, hey, a lot of these individuals are hypocrites. A lot of these people that you think are great, they are sinners in need of a savior. They need to repent. See, they start hearing that, and then the, the masses, they start to question these religious leaders, and they don't like that. They don't like that Jesus got the attention. And now they see it happening again. But now there's 12 of them that are being motivated just like Jesus. So it's like 12 Jesuses now. And so now they are even more jealous and they say, these people are getting the attention. They're getting the whole world on their side. And because of their jealousy, they, they immediately seek to quench it. They, they seek to get rid of them. And so they imprison them. They want to kill them. So they persecute them. They're hostile. We see this opposition growing. And I think as we think about this for our own personal life is, I think we need to recognize that growth will reveal to us our true allies. As you continue to grow in your faith, as you grow in holiness, maybe as you succeed in life, you really start to find out who's on your side. Because those who are jealous, those who see you succeeding, doing well, honoring God with your life, and if they're like, I don't like this version of you. I like where you were back this way. I don't want to see growth. I don't want to see you succeed. I don't want to see you move closer and closer to holiness. When you see people like that and you see them getting jealous or hostile towards you, you find that that is not a true ally. That is an enemy. That is a foe to your faith. And so you need to start wondering and, and, and considering who you are surrounding yourself with. Are the people that you are around, are they pointing you up? Are they, are they encouraging you to continue to grow? Or are they becoming jealous any time that you succeed? They hope and wish that it was for them. Because we need to surround ourselves with those who are there for our good. That's what the church is supposed to be, right? We're supposed to equip one another, which sometimes that can be challenging, right? Convicting. But we also are to encourage one another. Russ is a great encourager. Once again, reminding people how we have these talented people that come up and lead us in worship. We have people that are gifted and able to speak. We have people that come and serve in the church. That is such a great thing that we have people that use their gifts to worship God. Right? We are to encourage one another. We are to lift them up and encourage growth, encourage holiness. But as I said, we see in this account that there will be individuals that we will face that are not going to encourage they're not going to want you to grow. They, they want you to fail, and it's because of their sinful jealousy. And in those moments, I think what we need to do is we need to recognize we are to continue to grow despite our opposition. See, there will be opposition. And if you continue to grow, if you continue to succeed spiritually, there's going to be greater opposition. 
But in the midst of the opposition, in the midst of persecution or hostility, what we need to remind ourselves is surround ourselves with those who are for us that are going to lead us to our good and continue to grow. Don't let it be an excuse to stop growing. Continue to grow. And that's what we see the Spirit doing through the church here. They continue to grow even in the opposition. And how do, we do, how do they do that? How do we see this happening? Well, the, the second thing is we see that they rejoiced in suffering. See, a lot of people, when they experience the difficulty, they experience the opposition or the hostility, it, it starts to make them maybe backtrack, right? Or second-guess themselves, or, or, or they, they no longer want to grow, right? But what we see here is even in the moments of where they are being hard-pressed, even when they are experiencing suffering, they continue to grow. And they rejoice, it says. In verses 41 to 42, I just want to read this. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer. Shame for his name. And daily in the temple, in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. This is how you respond to your opposition. This is what true growth looks like, where you can rejoice. You can find joy even in very, very terrible seasons of life. Just think about this. They were put in prison. Now, this is the second time, at least, for, for Peter and John. And remember, Peter, at first, whenever Jesus got arrested by these same individuals, he fled. But now he's been arrested twice. You see no despair. You see no fear here. They're sitting in prison, in jail, and not knowing what's going to happen. It's not like God gave them, you know, the, the game plan and says, you're going to make it to here, and you're going to live all the way to here, and no one's going to harm you. He doesn't tell them when and where and how people are going to perish or, or if they're going to live to a ripe old age. So they're in prison. They could be dying just like their Savior did. They've already been sharing the gospel. It's been getting out of Jerusalem now. So maybe it was time for them to be done. They don't know. But even in the midst of this, they rejoice. They come back to their brothers and sisters in Christ, and instead of being upset and saying, man, they're really hard, they're, they, they hate us, you know, I'm, I'm so upset right now, rather they say, let us rejoice, because we stood up for our Savior. The name of Christ is continuing to be proclaimed. That's what we see here. And I think it's important that we remember that Jesus did warn them about this, right? Jesus, in, in Matthew 5, 10 to 12, he, he, he reminds them and tells them to expect persecution. But what I think sometimes we forget is not only that we are to expect persecution, but we're actually reminded when we are enduring persecution, we are instructed to rejoice. It's actually a command given to us by Christ. It says, blessed are those who are persecuted. This is the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. And then here it is. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. See, Jesus is saying, hey, there will be hostility. There will be opposition. There will be persecution as you continue to grow in holiness, as you continue to grow as a church, as a movement for God. But in the moments of hostility, we are to rejoice. We are to rejoice in suffering. And I think sometimes when we read the Bible verse about to rejoice or to have the joy of the Lord, I think sometimes we forget that even means, and especially means, in the moments where we find ourselves in suffering. Like I said, it's really easy to rejoice when everything is going great. But it's the midst of the storms that really tests your faith and really tests, do you have the joy of the Lord? And in fact, I think that our witness, right, we are called to be his witnesses, our witness is greater in suffering more so than it is in our contentment. Because here's the thing, if your life's going great and the world sees you saying, well, I just have the joy of the Lord, that's why I can be joyous. They're like, no, it's because your life's been so easy. You have no opposition. And you're probably not really growing, right? Because once again, if you're growing, you see the opposition, right? But no, if you were that person that you, you lose a loved one, 
If you are enduring suffering of, of sickness, maybe some problem with your health, maybe you just lost your job, maybe you're, you're battling an addiction, but you still can rejoice in the Lord. You can still have joy regardless of your circumstances. Life's not going right, but I still have joy. That is a true witness for Christ. That is what the world will see. That is what is being a light, being salt. When they see that you are so different, your circumstances do not dictate your joy. And it reminds me of um, the scripture that was read this morning in Sunday school. Psalm 1611, it says, In the presence of God, we find the fullness of of joy. Do you want the fullness of joy? It's to embrace and experience the presence of Christ. That is how we find the fullness of joy. The joy that does not move with our circumstances. Our joy is found in Christ. And that is why I think Philippians 4.4 gives us that calling. What does it say? It says to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. In this verse, what does it say? It says rejoice at the beginning, rejoice at the end, and what's in the middle? The Lord always. That is what our life looks like. Beginning to end, we can have joy in God because we have his presence. So you might be suffering right now. You might be enduring hardship. You might be dealing with anxiety or depression. But here's the thing, the Lord is with you, and in his presence is the fullness of joy. You can overcome these things. Christ can give you the strength, and I think that's exactly what we're seeing in this account. Christ was with them. In the prison cell, Jesus was with them. When they go to proclaim, Jesus is with them. When they perform miracles, Jesus was with them. And what does he say in the Great Commission? He says, Lo, I will be with you always. Jesus was with the apostles. And that is how they could rejoice, even after being bloodily, brutally beaten, imprisoned. It wasn't just a pretty prison cell, right? They were beaten, and they still are rejoicing. Their circumstances did not dictate their joy that is found in Christ. And that is why I think David was alluding to once again in Psalm 23, one of the most famous psalms, right? It says that the Lord, Christ, is my shepherd. What does it say? I shall not want. What that means is I have all that I need. In the presence of our shepherd, in the, in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have everything that we need. And then in verse 4, what does it say? It says, yea, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Not some evil. No evil. For you are with me. Your presence is with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The presence of Christ is with you. He goes with you on mission. I think it's so interesting that we have the Great Commission, one of the most famous verses, and we have Psalm 23, one of the most famous verses, and it's a reminder that Christ is with us. He is the one who will guide us. He is the one that will protect us. He is the one that will encourage us. He is the one that gives us joy. That is what we see, I think, in this text. And and because of their joy, they were able to obey God and trust Him and knew that He would take care of the consequences. That's how you can find joy in every single circumstance. You obey God, you trust his commands, you live it out, and you know that God's going to take care of the rest. Right? What do we see with the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000? What is it? They give what they had, and then what does God do? He feeds the 5,000, right? We give what we have, we give it to God, and God performs the miracles. So that's what we see here. And then I just love this so much that right when they get out of the the prison cells, the 12 went right back to preaching. Why do they do that? Because they know Christ is with them, but they also know that their God is unstoppable. 
You cannot stop the proclamation of Christ. And that's what we see in this third point, is that God cannot be stopped. God cannot fail. And I think really we see from the beginning of Genesis all the way to the end of Revelation, that's what the story is reminding us of that fact. Whenever things look hopeless, when things look bleak, when there is great opposition or hostility, we see God overcomes. God wins, right? That's the story. God wins. And in verse 19 to 20, or verses 19 to 21, we see just a glimpse of this again. See, an angel of God, he comes and he frees them from prison. Think about that. This would be a hopeless situation. If you were thrown in prison, your life is on the line, you couldn't get much lower than that, right? It's a pretty terrible situation to be in. And you wouldn't think, oh, I mean, there's these bars, right? You're, in, you're locked in. Nobody has the strength or the means to get out. But God simply sends a messenger, an angel, and they're out. That's the difference between God and this world. See, this world, we see all the difficulty. We don't see a way that we can overcome. We don't see a way we can get through it. But then God just does one little thing. He might speak a word, and it's over. See, God, compared to this world, there's no comparison. God is greater. And I think it's so funny, too, is because when the apostles, they were thrown in prison, why? Because they had just performed the miracles, right? So they were trying to stop the miracles, right? They were trying to stop them from doing the miracles. But what happens because of them imprisoning them? A miracle happens. They get freed from prison. The angel comes and opens the gates. That's what happens when you try to oppose God. You don't stop the miracles. You increase the miracles. So no, poor, uh, no power, no force, no authority can stop God. And I think that this is just a taste of what we saw with the resurrection, by the way. See, they looked into the prison, and there was no one there. Because the world couldn't hold them. Same thing with the empty tomb. The tomb could not hold Christ. Christ has overcome the world. He has, he has defeated the enemies of darkness. See, Christ has overcome this, and we are seeing now his witnesses are doing the same. By Christ's power, we can overcome because our God is unstoppable. And that's actually the advice that we start to learn in verses 33 to 39 with Gamaliel, who we started with. Because Gamaliel, what he does is he actually he persuades the Sanhedrin not to oppose the apostles anymore. Not to move forward with trying to kill them, right? He sets them, puts the apostles outside and says, let's talk about this for a second. And he gives them some, some advice. And now, I don't think that everything that Gamaliel said here was, was perfectly right. Um, because I would say that he, first off, he compares Jesus with the insurrectionists. He says that, you know, basically, he's probably just like another zealot that's trying to overthrow Rome, right? We have these two other individuals that they, they got to power, they were killed, and then the movement fell. So I don't think I would ever compare Jesus to these insurrectionists because Jesus is so much greater. The next thing is he says that the works of man will come to nothing. Now there is a, a, a glimmer of truth there because we know at the end of days, the things of man, they will cease. They won't come to anything when it comes to the final judgment. But we do see that in the current circumstance or current context, if there are the schemes of man, if there is the spiritual enemy coming upon us, we shouldn't do nothing. And that's kind of his advice here. If it's of the world or if it's of man, there should be no action. And I don't think that's right. I think as, as spiritual shepherds, as Christians, we should oppose the things of man. We should act. We shouldn't just do nothing. But he, but I, but he was right that when it comes to God and man, we see that God cannot be stopped. He says if we are fighting against God, you will not be overthrowing it. And so that's why he warns them and says, I fear that if we fight against the apostles, it may constitute us fighting against God. And I think that is the greatest wisdom that he had there was this. As we're seeing the witness of these individuals' lives, and I think that God may possibly be on their side, so therefore I think we should refrain from opposing them. And it's interesting because the Sanhedrin, these are the religious leaders of the people of Israel, right? And you know what the word Israel means? It means one who wrestles with God. 
or one who fights with God. And that's exactly what the people of Israel have been doing since they sent the prophets. They sent Jesus. They sent the apostles. Israel has been warring and fighting and wrestling against God. And I wonder how many of us sometimes are playing the part of Israel in our own lives. Are you that person that has just continued to resist to truly submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ? Or are you a person that you, you, you've been a Christian maybe for a long time and you know that God's been calling you to be more committed, to do more for the kingdom, to repent of a sin that you continue to repeat secretly? You keep wrestling with God because you have not submitted to him fully. If you are that person that has played the part of Israel, if you are fighting and wrestling against God, recognize this truth here, that God cannot be stopped. God will not fail. So we can either be for him, we can be with him, and we can find the joy that comes with going with him, or we can be found on the opposite side with these religious leaders who were jealous, and we can fail and lose. Because God, he will not lose. So we have to choose and pick a side here. Are we those who are encouraging growth and holiness? Are we moving forward with the kingdom of God to grow in number day by day? Are we finding joy and encouraging others to find the joy? even in the midst of suffering, or are we those who are opposing God himself, fighting against an unstoppable God? That's the question I think that these religious leaders are left with, and I think that's the question that we are left with. Whose side are we on? Because the good news of the gospel is this. Though we all have been against God at some point, God loves us anyway, and he sent Jesus so that we could be on his side. Jesus dies on the cross so that we can be on God's side. He rises from the dead, rose from the dead so that we can be on his side forever, have eternal life. All we have to do is give up our jealousy, give up our pride, and no longer oppose God. So I think that's what we see here. So growth, we see, attracts opposition. We are to rejoice in suffering, and we are to remember this wonderful, beautiful truth. God cannot be stopped. Let us pray. Father, we, we come to you with grateful hearts, Lord. We rejoice in you, in your presence, that we can find you wherever we go. And Lord, I pray that we would be faithful witnesses, that we would continue to encourage growth in our, in our local body here, in, in our communities, in our, in our world, Lord, that we would seek to grow in holiness and grow in more, more like your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that we would um, cast off and repent of anything where we are in opposition to you that we would submit to you and your lordship and know that you are unstoppable and that you are good and that you win in the end. So I pray that we all would be on your side. In Jesus' name.